But um, that is the number one thing I get asked is, what do I set? So I created the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet to help that out. It's very popular. But, um, okay, great. It's a piece of paper. It tells you what to do. But some people need even a little bit more help. And so, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Betcher did a great job implementing this brain dump of mine. Um, I think his comment when my email, when I sent them, the outline was like, wow, no, really, wow. <laughs> and then he had to go, he had to go do it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, today I told, I fist bumped at him and said, wow, good job. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. So basically, when you when you kick off the tool, it's going to um, it's going to check if you've got the proper auditing set, and if you don't, it's going to just die, right? It's going to tell you, okay, you need these things because there's I'm, I'm sorry I can't help you right now. You got to set these things first. So when you kick it off, um, it'll it'll show you. Hey, I, I'm trying to read this white list. You don't have it. I'm trying to read this other white list. You don't have it, and and that's fine. But then it gets into the audits, uh, audit policies of your computer. So it says, you know, uh, I need this particular object access registry set as um, success. So then you have to go in and set that before the tool will run. So let's see if I can. There's an um, important point to make here. One of the challenges is that Windows by default will not collect anything useful for a security person. It just it just by default doesn't record anything. And that's one of the first agendas I have in any place I get involved with or consult with people on. It's like, look, you have to enable and configure this stuff first or there'll be no value. So it didn't make any sense for this tool to run unless the thing was configured to collect the data that we want to collect. So just stop and then force the person, right? Try to push them down the path of, you gotta turn it on first, you gotta turn it on first. And that's kind of the goal here is to is to help lead people to actually enabling the things that are required. Now you see it's also looking for certain um, uh, registry items as well. But for this version, I didn't make that a requirement. <clears throat> uh, it will be. So I go ahead and run the tool again, and then it starts collecting the data from your your logs, okay? And this is a one since I didn't set these policies uh, a few days in advance. There's not much to collect on this machine, um, but it did give me a report, which says, uh, "Guess what? Here's what you have set." So we have. Uh, all your audit policies here, the uh, CIS benchmarks, what they recommend. We've got the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet, uh, what it recommends, and then the current uh, computer and any notes that may apply to those. So you see that I don't have uh, PowerShell enabled on this computer, and it gives me a um, some footnotes. How do I add these? And, of course, references as well. So this is a report that you can uh, create for your machine, uh, you know, <clears throat> to give to an auditor. Or if you are an auditor, say, hey, run this tool. Give me this report. Let's see what you have set. Um, it's great if you're, uh, Michael, you want to go into it if you're, uh, you know, an investigator or a right. you know, contractor so going in to investigate a breach. The first thing, uh, which Betcher fortunately found out that I laughed about, one of the I, I was involved in the Center for Internet Benchmarks, both Windows and uh, heavily in the HPUX when I worked at HP, and I lobbied for getting the CIS benchmarks when it was uh, back in the XP 2000 2003 days to rearrange the benchmarks to match the uh, alphabetical order of GPO, the group policy objects. Uh, Betcher found in the course of actually writing this that the order in which the stuff spit out was not alphabetical, which made uh, a bit of a challenge because if you're trying to take this data and go to your GPO and set the data, right, set these settings, uh, you're going to see account log on first, you're going to see account management uh, second. The actual dump, by the way, Windows does it is system is first. So you end up jumping around. You know what happens when that occurs. Mistakes happen. It's, you it's, miss something. Yeah, it's very this manageable. particular order here, which if you if you use audit poll get, it'll dump it out in the order that it is in the system. Yeah, and that, that's, that's not real practical. 
yeah, it, it was really, really kind of mundane. So, uh, being that I've been, I'm an auditor, I'm actually a, a certified information security auditor, CISA, ISACA certified, uh, done that lots in the course of my career, is, look, I need to provide something to the people that are making recommendations to companies, um, and this allows me to cut and paste this piece of information and put it in the back of my report saying, you really need to go further than CIS uh, does. I can I can demonstrate to you why the Windows logging cheat sheet is better, and uh, in the course of this tool, you would actually see that data. And then uh, this PC would also be indicative to what a typical enterprise system would have set. So if this was a basically domain attached machine, you ran this, this would be what your GPO looked like. And now you can guide these people into setting these. Uh, we plan to add more things like, you know, obviously, NIST and whatnot, and put these in here as well um, and give you footnotes. And, and as Windows 10 and 2016 come out, you know, make those things that are new to that point out for those of us who remember the oldest stuff and try to really help push these guys into changing and recording these things. Because even though in LogMD we only collect certain things for security-related, once I, I, you know, if I'm a, a incident guy and I'm looking at this tool and I want to go, I'm going to run the tool and look for things, I only had to enable what made the tool work. But now if I have to go back to the box or the environment in general, let's say we did this through GPO, and I wanted to go back to those suspect boxes, if you don't turn all the things on that are recommended here, I'm not going to have the additional data that I'm going to need to further and fully investigate and or print the logs to be able to turn over to, you know, our, our obviously our federal friends, our, our bureau friends, and they constantly tell people, uh, look, I can't help you. You want to say, who did this? How did this happen? I can't help you if you don't have the logs turned on. And so the idea here is to kind of drive people to turn this stuff on, guide people to what to turn on, and even give them a tool to get them started so they can see the value of what can be collected. Yeah, I mean, I make uh, Windows API calls, right? That's all I do. I'm using Windows to uh, to help help discover malware in your environment, help help your logging, right? So there's nothing to install. You just you know double click, like I said, and that's it. Yeah. Um, you don't have to install Perl or Python or Ruby or Java. You know, it, it's all. You know, there embedded in your operating system. I just help uh, the program. Just helps you know what to set. I mean, look, look right here. Um, credential validation. CIS and Windows logging cheat sheets say you need to audit success and failure, but you know, by default, Windows does not. Yeah, it's pretty sad. It's important to note that that. Uh Yeah, meet the requirements of the tool first, and then we can go further. So Based that's on the best tool. practice of the industry and the experts that say this is what you need to collect. Mm -hmm. it also, you know, Betcher pointed out that when we mentioned malware, this tool has far extensive uses outside of the malware lab. Uh, this thing started from the fact that I was uh, assessing a lot of malware, and I wanted to speed that up. And I wrote a bunch of scripts. I'm a script master, and, and I do that because, again, least common denominator. Working in consulting for all the years, I know what every Windows box has on its system. And if I write my scripts to, and to work that way, they'll work everywhere. Same thing with using shell scripts for, for Nix systems. I went to clients with HP that had HPOX that had Perl, but they had different versions of Perl. Right. I went to clients that had Java, but they had different versions of Java. The, you know, the original CIS benchmark scoring tool was written in Java. <clears throat> and so if you didn't have the requirements, these things didn't run well, and there were a lot of issues with it. So the idea was initially to solve a specific problem, but it became very apparent very quickly that this had a much more extensive scenario. For example, uh, we already here have a tool that auditors can use or IT people can use or even implementers can use for any log solution to get a client started to collect something useful. So right there, you've got an architect assistant tool. 
you, you can measure the auditing. You can give it to the auditors. So you have an auditing tool, right? So that's that's just one purpose. We haven't even got into any of the InfoSec related stuff yet other than compliance and check the box and, and whatnot. PCI tells you you need to audit. This actually tells you what exactly you need to audit and, and actually in a lot of ways tells you how. Um, the report obviously gives you details. We'll get into that in a second. There's whitelists. We all know that there's a lot of stuff on the system that's noise, now, normal noise, or the information that spits out isn't really worth anything to us security people. Um, but keep in mind, um, this isn't necessarily just for security and malware. This will find failed and su successful logins. So this is a behavior, a malicious detection tool, which means you can use it for anything in regards to the system that's abnormal, uh, internal employee issues, uh, you know, potentially misbehaving applications. But then, of course, our focus initially was malware. Uh, it's clear that this can be used for a lot of purposes. And I'm guessing we're going to get requests to expand it for, for various things. So uh, Malware Analysis Lab, that's what it was designed for. And we'll show you kind of some of the outcomes of that. Investigate a suspect system. I don't know if that thing's infected. And so what we'll do, and, and I'll show you a copy of my output, very large, raw output. And I'm going to actually show you how fast... I can parse through the data in Excel and get to the point where I can say, yep, got nothing in my box that worries me. I think that's powerful because now I have some idea, short of it being that upper 5% of super secret stealthy APT, um, that my box is clean. And that's powerful. So we just really don't have that in the industry. When you, when you have a machine that's potentially infected, somebody says, I, I click this link, uh, I need this thing to be checked. What's the first thing that your IT department does? Well, if McAfee didn't catch it or, you know, Norton, they'll go grab a copy of malware bikes on a USB stick, shove it in, s install it, and then start running a scan. What happens if malware bytes doesn't find it? They say it's clean, right? S but um, is it really clean? What happens with malware is you execute it and then uh most of the time it will delete itself and install a new copy or it'll go to command and control and download a new version of itself right with a different signature so it always stays off the radar for AV at least the good ones do and Michael you you may be able to go into or I know you'll be able to go into more detail about that but um you know you've had scenarios where you've been told yeah this system's clean and you knew for a fact that it had malware on the machine yeah that's that's the challenge right i'm i'm one of those skilled people that you know you tell me something's clean i'm going to i'm going to challenge you uh, if if i have a gut feeling um, I, gut feeling is actually in my training material because some of us have experience and that's all we have to go on is a gut feeling um, I have to give a lot of kudos to a former coworker of mine uh, we had a we had a linux box environment and the uh, stress vulnerability came out and one of our engineers looked at it and said, yeah, I'm not finding anything. And, uh, you know, my colleague said, yeah, something's telling me something's there. And I'm like, yeah, I don't buy it. They, they didn't just do that to the box. And sure enough, persistence paid off and we looked and looked and looked and sure enough, uh, through his persistence, he actually found the root kit. And, and, and that's experience. That's, that's just the way we work. Right. So, um, sometimes you, if you don't know, well, that's what you have to do. You have to apply our logic into some tool set, and that's what we've done here, and, and apply malware discovery techniques to see and prove and try to validate with a fairly high certainty that this box is probably okay to go. And that's the logic there. Well, I guess, um, Michael, this is where you take over on your demo. Okay. If you can share your screen. I am sure I can. Well. You, so what we you, could do, what, did one you thing stop, we could do. Did you do stop sharing? Oh, no. I think there's a... Uh, 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 right click. There we go. I right. stop sharing. So <clears throat> one thing you could do is, is to try and detect persistence on the machine. So if the machine wasn't set for proper logging to begin with, 
you can then use LogMD to uh, help you set the right logging. And then once it is set, reboot your machine and then see what happens on a reboot. Obviously, if mal- malware has to be persistent or if it's programmed to be persistent, it has to save itself on disk when the machine is shut down and then load itself again when the machine boots up. And so what we can do with LogMD is find that uh, and detect that persistence at work. Now, it's, it's important to note that that means it has to trigger some behavior that the Windows logging is, is triggering. Um, there's a lot of discussion. I've, I've had some with some pen testers and my own personal experience with some APT uh, that there are some very clever ways that look normal in startup for being persistent. But uh, the malware discovery process uh, will find that kind of oddity. So this isn't trying to fill that particular gap. Uh, but there are other behaviors in the course of an infection and or uh, a reboot to trigger an infection is that there are potentially are auto run locations. Uh, commodity malware uses very obvious locations. And so uh, this isn't going to address that 5%, you know, uh, clever, quote unquote, really is somewhat sophisticated malware, uh, uh, far to use term in, in regards to malware. This is uh, not going to find those conditions it wasn't designed to. Um, that is That is a unique case. But there are other techniques you can add to this thus taking, again, an hour and me being fairly certain that those other techniques are also not on the box. So I can focus more at that higher-end detail and not worry about these lower ends. So in this case, what I've done, um, again, I have logging turned on to the kazoo, so I've got 1.4 million records in my particular output. So I've got a fairly large report. And so, again, it's a CSV. Um, This is the raw output of my box. I immediately do things um, automatically just because of of habit to make things more readable. Uh, As you can see, the spreadsheet has a lot of data in it. Uh, don't don't let that intimidate you because um, it's it's how you parse through the data that's going to help. Uh, being that's obviously big, I'm going to split the screen, uh, making it easy for me. Oops, split, and I lost my left side panel, so let's try that again. I got to be somewhere else. Split the screen and get my left column over here so I can see this, and get my upper column so I can see way up there. And this way, when I, as I scroll around, I still have the data that I want, right? I can now see the left side and I can see the top side. So, so now I got all this data. There's lots of stuff in here. It's like, where do I start? Um, I, you know, for me personally, uh, the goal here is going to end up being that I want to find the date of the event, right? I'm, I'm trying to focus that in because then I can use all the other logs or any of the other indicators or any of my other tools to focus in that time period. That's what I'm, that's what I'm after if I'm doing a lab analysis or, or incident response. But in this case, I got a system I have no idea what the state is. So we have lots of columns to pick from. And um, the computer name, if I was to do multiples in one spreadsheet, uh, I, I obviously need that piece of information. But one of the biggest things I tell people that, that we have to enable, that we fail the tool for if it is not set, is processing command line. So uh, Excel is great for this because if I go to data and I hit filter uh, and I turn filtering on, which will take a minute because this spreadsheet's ginormous, I can now uh, look at the data and eventually when it finally parses through the data. And I can now uh, kind of group things together or dedupe things to say, yeah, that's not the droid I'm looking for and exclude it from the results. And I take this massive spreadsheet and I shrink it very quickly. And remember, this is 1.4 million records. I do have whitelists uh, available to me, right? We have a uh, an IP address whitelist. We have a uh, process name and process command line whitelist. Uh, the IP address whitelist is by source, destination, and destination port. We're ignoring source port. Uh, if you do this, you'd probably understand why we do that. There's just too many of them. And um, in the process name, bad way to exclude things. But there are cases you do want to do that with a high return value because there may be process names that you want to exclude, but yet the command line will be totally different. So you really want to focus at the command line. Uh, but the pair of those allow you to, to really parse this data down uh, drastically if you want. Um, the third is the file and registry auditing location. So if you turn on file and registry auditing, which I do in my labs, they're highly audited so that when malware affects a reg key or drops files to certain directories that I want to watch, how do I know where to watch for those? 
the malware management reports that we spoke about earlier, that gives me a clue where to look for. There's a very consistent pattern of what the kind of places to look for. And so, um, you know, I can obviously sort this data uh, any way I want. We have headers, so I can say, just give me process command line. And, you know, I can immediately see uh, there's the NVIDIA login. I, I really don't care about the NVIDIA login. So what I want to do is take the filtering capability of Excel now that it's deduped everything and I can say I'm going to turn everything off. I'm going to get rid of everything in the command line. Um, the one thing I definitely cannot get rid of is, well, it's under N, so i got to go up to N, is i got to keep the NAs because that means I don't want to get rid of the ones that don't have a command line because that's something different. So I'm going to look through this and say, all right, so are any of these any of these items here something that I absolutely know from either experience or malware management that it's not something I want to look at? Um, this top line has a lot of garbage in it, so I'm just going to leave it. Uh, AT broker, yeah, let's say I'm not sure, so I'm going to leave it. But I happen to know this is the NVIDIA normal way of the NVIDIA thing. I don't want to see that in my traffic. So that means all this traffic you see on my screen right here right, is going to disappear because I'm unselecting it. And I can go through here and say, yeah, I really don't need to see any of the mobile device stuff. It's in the right place. It has the right look. I see this pretty consistently. And when you see these kind of quantities, that's what the whitelist is for. You'll take the spreadsheet, for example, and I can just copy and paste the NVIDIA into the whitelist after I've determined either through hash, ver hash verification, if you want to go through the, uh, the hashing mechanism, or however you decide you're going to trust this and throw it out of my results. And so I can come down here and say, okay, let's see. I don't come on files log. Eh, let's leave those in there. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, VMware, okay, I've got ESXi, so I know what that is. Uh, Dropbox, well, let's see. Is it in the right place? Program files, x86, yes. Uh, these are pretty typical for Dropbox. I've got all the Chrome stuff. Uh, obviously, our browsers, we're logging that, but I'm going to ignore the browsers because that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for specific binaries in this at this point. Here's the Google update occurring. I can ignore all that. Here's here's uh, a gum thing, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that. It's Google update. Now nah, I'm going to take it out. Uh, here's Intel's management software. I have a RAID on this particular box, so I don't need to see that data either. Logitech, well, we're on a webcam, so I don't need to see that either. Mozilla Firefox, again, I'm not interested in the browser at this point. I can always go back and open up to everything once I get some time area that I want to focus on. And I can come through here. Here's NVIDIA's drivers. Yeah, they're in the right place. There's nothing odd here. Here's NX log client that I run. Here's the Skype stuff running. Common files, Apple. Here's uh, Logitech stuff. Here's program files for Microsoft Shared, HP Office Jet. Uh, stuff for the printer. Um, all right, I'm going to leave that one in here. Uh, rapid storage, again, uh, we know what that is. Office, uh, the office kicking off. We can see Excel. I have Outlook, PowerPoint. Um, you know, let's say I'll leave a Word one in there just because I play with Word malware a lot. And uh, Microsoft Security, so here's the Security Essentials suite. I go down here and here's the real tech audio drivers. Uh, VNC is running for remote control. Uh, here's the media player stuff. All right, that, that seems okay to me. And then here we're getting the user space. So here's where I'm going to pay close attention. User space. This is where most commodity malware is going to attack you. So now pay kind of attention to what's going on here. Google Home users, yep, yeah, seen that before. Logitech webcam looks okay. Since I just installed that, we're good. Uh, webcam stuff here. Uh, temp, etc. cetera. Roaming Foxit, yep, I've got Foxit on here. We're good. Uh, the Microsoft Framework stuff's executing, yep. Yeah. Experience tells me, oop, Reg Edit ran, don't know why. We'll take a look at that. We got some software distribution, yeah, yeah, yeah. System 32, these are the actual executables. Audio DG, well, obviously we're on a Skype call, so this is normal. And uh, I'm now at the bottom of the list. And we'll keep the command shell stuff because that potentially is fishy. Um, and so I'm going through this. Defrag, we saw the defrag ran, yada, yada, yada. And boom, here's Notepad running a couple times. Here's where I'm opening up some, some batch files. We're good there. Uh, RegEdit32 ran, we'll leave that. RAS Servo, we'll leave that. Uh, power Config, we know we've got energy savings scenarios gone. There's SC starting to stop in services, I'll keep that. Service Host, these are pretty typical. You would whitelist these out because these start up on boot. Um, they, they, obviously, Service Host can be misused. And I can go through this really quickly and kind of determine if there's focal areas that I want to look at. And I'll scroll down here. There's WBM embedding. That's always going to look that way. I don't need to worry about that. 
I'm looking for the odd WBM launches. Um, here's the driver install for all the NVIDIA stuff that I did or the, all the uh, Logitech stuff I did. Boom, boom, boom. Remember, I'm going through 1.4 million records. And here's run DLL32. Uh, might be important, so we'll pay attention to that. Uh, definitely malware can utilize this to launch DLLs. And spool drivers, okay. You know, And again, initial responses, these look okay. These are all the tasks running. They're normally scheduled. There's a ton of them, obviously, in the system. I can come back and look at these if I find some other data that's interesting in the time frame. Uh, when login occurred, let's take a look at that. There's putty executing. We'll take a look at that. And uh, installer and then the blanks. And so we won't, we won't worry about the blanks. And I hit OK. And suddenly now the amount of data I have just shrank by if you look at this real quickly, uh, the NAs are now the dominant thing. These are all the things that have no command line. So I took 1.4 million records and went through here and said, wow, that's all I got. So now I can focus a little better at what's going on here and go really quickly. Are any of these odd? Uh, they really aren't. So now I can even filter those out even further. I said, well, clearly you don't need that RAS server. I don't need that. Yeah, that looks okay. AT broker looks good. We'll leave that one in there. Scroll down here. Intel, we'll get rid of that one. Office Windward, I'll leave that one in there just so we have some data. RegEdit, we'll leave that one in there. And uh, System32 Command EXE, we'll leave those in there. And get rid of the RAS server, there's a big bulk of that. And uh, hit OK. And suddenly look at the amount of command lines that were executed in my box. That quickly, I went through 1.4 million records, and I can tell you these are the only potential suspicious commands that were executed on a box on my system. So right now, I very quickly said, yeah, this box is clean. Okay. Uh, you, you got a tool that can do that? I know I don't have a tool that can do that. Um, I've got all kinds of other data in here in regards to what launched these command lines. And so I potentially, the parent that launched that. Um, and as we scroll over, the reason this is so wide is different event codes have different data associated with it. So some of these these items are, are uh, going to take up three or four columns, another event code will take up three or four columns, and so we keep stacking those to the right. At some point, we'll address that. Correct. Correct. So I can filter by specifically by event codes, right? Because we have the, the coding here. So let's say I want to focus in on only, I'm going to look at only the Sysmo, I happen to have Sysmon running in my box. It's one of the things uh, we look for in our side. Not uh, The free version that you get will not have this um, because it's not built into Windows. And I want to say I only want to focus in on the event ones because they give me a hash of the files. So if I get down to the point where I, and again, this is a malware lab, right? So I definitely want to have hashes as, a, as an option to me. If let's say these are suspicious files to me, I will capture the hashes, which of course, what do I do with those? Virus total. And you can see at a 1.4 million records, I'm down to a handful that I'm going to actually go investigate hashes for. Or let's say I want to focus on, for those of us, uh, some people that really like the network side, we'll say, all right, let's look at the network side. So I'm going to deselect everything and pick the Sysmon 3 events and then also the 5156 Windows Firewall events. And so now I can focus, uh, again, this data no longer becomes useful because it's focusing at the uh, process execution. Now what I'm after is what the image that launched the uh, connection, which is what the Windows Firewall will give you. It's very powerful in that it, that you can find, okay, I went to some IP address, some destination IP address, but um, what actually was the application that went there? So if this was a suspect, if Firefox was a suspect malware executable, I would now have the external IPs that I would need to go plug into Splunk or potentially ask my network guys, block these. And I'm actually going to be an example of exactly that here in a second. But this is an example of how you use this tool to investigate a system and determine whether or not it's clean or not. And again, now I'm focused at these particular events. I can go through here and say, well, because the filtering dedupe stuff, you can see the list is pretty short. I can say, well, what do I really want to look at that's interesting? Um, yeah, not a lot in here that I want to see. There's nothing here. It's interesting. Office, Word. Now, let's say I have Word running. So... Um, 
Uh, do I am I investigating word malware? Maybe something got launched there. So we'll, we'll kind of look and see if word communicated out to any. Again, we're looking at network events. Now, which what apps communicated outbound? And this is where the IP whitelist comes in. So if you're running stuff um, that normally connects out to Dropbox or Google Cloud, you know all your Google stuff that's normal, all your Adobe stuff that's normal, all your Microsoft stuff that's normal. You whitelist that out, and you wouldn't even see this in here. But I, I left this wide open so we can get a really good demo of how fast we can parse through data with this tool and get an idea. And, uh, you know, we can see specifically what IP addresses B and C might be visiting in case that was the uh, the culprit in regards to communication channels. And and that's basically how we use the tool. There's other event codes uh, that we collect. Uh, we won't go through all of them. It's, it's pretty extensive. Uh, but tasks that are scheduled, firewall changes that occur, services that are started and stopped and or added to the system, uh, processes that execute, shares that are connected. Uh, these are the top 10 event type things that I report. Um, I'm actually speaking at SplunkConf next week, or actually last week. Uh, I spoke at SplunkConf, if we're doing this in the, in the future. <laughs> and um, these are the kind of things I'll share with them saying, you want to start somewhere, Windows Logging Sheet Sheet, these event codes, start here, get really good at this. It'll make obvious sense where you expand from there. Um, and then uh, obviously all the cases, uh, states of the uh, task scheduler and what happens here, that's what these commands are. And then uh, in, in stuff that uh, Brian and I use, we're playing with Sysmon and other tools, uh, maybe future features possibly. And uh, this data then becomes very usable very quickly. But that fast, I was able to say, yeah, this, this system's 95% uh, uh, clean. I'm, I, am, I have a 99% certainty I'm in good shape. And Can you, uh, Michael... Brian, you had a question? Yeah, can you unplug your mic and plug it back in? It's getting a little static. I don't know, Bright, can you hear that as well? <laughs> Better? Okay. So far. All right, so let's look at a box I investigated that had a crypto event. Um, so... The, this is a great example of um, why file auditing would be very, very important. I tell everybody, you know, hey, where do I start with file auditing? So we're not talking the auditing settings. This can be very confusing to people. The auditing settings, the advanced audit policies is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going into Explorer, and I'll actually do it so we can see what we're talking about. I'll actually uh, go into Explorer, drag the window over here so you guys can see it. And I want to say, I tell everybody, you must go into Windows System32, for example, the WBM directory, because this is a great injection point for the bad guys. Right click, properties, security, advanced, auditing. This is what I'm talking about. So I can set this and say, I want to add everyone. Right? So now I'm turning on auditing for files, but this is the key. You have to pay very close attention to what you're setting. If you're in Windows directory, never ever set subfolders. You will create so many entries in your logs that the noise will overwhelm you and you won't get any value. In the WBM directory, on the other hand, you can very easily leave this and say, what I'm after is new stuff. I don't care about Microsoft updates. I'm worried about malware being dropped. That's brand spanking new DLL that's going to be injected. So I'm going to look for creates, and I want to look for permission changes, take ownership, and change permissions. That right there is all I'm going to do and apply that. I now am collecting those file auditing items. I would do the same thing in the registry for um, the run keys and any auto runs that I'd be interested in collecting, right? That's that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about in file auditing. So um, the unique thing about this particular case, this is a, a captured log of a reboot of a crypto locker event. Again, where do we start? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, well, uh, I got to get rid of the noise that is normal. So let's go ahead and filter that out and say, well, command line obviously is important. Here's the command line over here. Shift it over and say, uh, you, you know, sometimes it's easier for people's eyes just to go ahead and sort the data. So that is an option you can do, obviously, ahead of time so that the stuff's in some sort of logical order before you filter. And uh, go ahead and say, all right, so what's on this box? Same routine we just went through, clearly a lot less, right? Uh, we need the NAs, so we're going to unselect everything, put NA back in here and say, all right, what is this real tech audio? All right, I'm going to let that slide. Uh, Tortoise SVN, okay, we know what SVN is. Bob, app data, roaming, what the hell's that? Uh, I want to see those. Weird named files in roaming. Uh, CryptoLocker is known for using the roaming directory. 
Uh, Explore, well, maybe it phoned home to something. Command.exe, let's see what happened there. Uh, the consent uh, looks like something maybe elevated. Um, huh, VSC service. Ah, that happens to be volume shadow copy. That's interesting. That shouldn't have executed normally. So let's see what we get with just those commands. VSS admin. Um, let's see what we got. So there's I, I selected what? And the half of them? I hit OK. Um, now what I can see is um, some stuff that I worked on. I'm like, OK, well, I don't need to see this data. That's just me accepting the EULA, so we'll throw that out. Scroll this over a bit so we can get a better view of it. And we'll obviously get rid of this uh, EULA. And we'll say, yeah, we do not need to see that data. And hit OK. And suddenly now what we have is a very short list of information. Now, this is a suspect box. I actually did not know what was on this box when I started this process, when I ran this. Um, I immediately see this. I see that in app data roaming, there's an executable going on. Okay. Um, right now, we have no network activity because CryptoLocker does not do that. Um, it, it basically will drop stuff on there, and you get these HTML files that tells you where to go. But there's no communication channels back after the things doing the crypto uh, process. Uh, you can see here that RabbitMQ is on here. So I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to get rid of RabbitMQ. Um, I don't really care about RabbitMQ. Again, scroll over so we can actually read this. I wish filtering would auto shift on us. So let's get rid of that piece of noise. And suddenly we're down to a handful of events. So the interesting thing that points out on this is it's very apparent very quickly that um, this is the malware event right here. So what's happening is the, the executable occurred here. It then called, uh, you know, command.exe called uh, the roaming new variable. Uh, it actually changed names. So as you launch the crypto malware, it writes a different copy with a different name in a different location. I would see those names actually if I do the, the, the basic analysis on it. And then oddly enough, uh, VSS admin was was executed and it actually deleted the volume shadow copies. And why is that important in CryptoLocker? I can't do a restall, re restore. Now what's also apparent here is there's no file auditing or registry auditing turned on on this particular system that I did. I only turned on what I needed to make LogMD work. But that quickly, I'm able to determine this is where the malware resides. This is what I need to go clean up. And oh, by the way, the volume shadow copies got whacked as well. So there's an example of a malicious system. And then the last example we have is a big event. Ooh, lots of stuff in here. Okay, same same routine. Let's go ahead and, and uh, sort the data off of something just to make it easier to, to consume to the eye. And say command, I'll start with command line, and I'm going to go ahead and turn filtering on. And uh, let's go ahead and way the heck over to the right. All right, so we want to be over here. And I'm most interested, obviously, in the command line. And again, same routine. I'm going to go ahead and say, let's take a look at this. And let's say, let's get rid of all the stuff that we know is just normal noise in Windows. Again, how do I know that? Malware management and the reports that are that are done by the malware uh, analyst companies doing the IR firms and the clearly the reports that uh, are done by AB companies kind of give you a clue of what's going on. Plus, you can kind of look at some of these and say, do I really care that Conhost is opening a session? Conhost is the window around everything that gets launched, and each one has a session. Yeah, that's not telling me anything or ever will tell me anything in regards to, to what I'm looking for. So I'm going to say, let's get rid of all those. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this, get rid of all these con hosts. Um, uh, you know, a Tribs, that's, that's interesting. I'm pretty sure on this box that Trib was not something that I executed. Again, this is a lab scenario where I actually executed a payload. Um, I'm going to keep this. I'm going to look at the NVIDIA stuff. No, I know NVIDIA is the driver of the lab box. So I'm going to ignore that. Uh, set up uh, Ctemp. What happened here? Um, that's interesting. I don't really recognize that. I'm going to keep it. Um, again, Chrome. We're going to ignore Chrome because I launched Chrome to investigate stuff after the fact. Google update. Let's get rid of that. Install Office. Uh, BSS sync shutdown. We'll keep the Office stuff. Excel's me. We'll keep the Word stuff. 
um, because that happened to be the uh, thing that I launched was a word, a malicious Word document. Um, there's the template for Word. We'll keep that. Uh, let's see, shared office. Um, yeah, okay, we'll keep that just to see what it is. Uh, the Microsoft Security Client Agents, yeah, not interested. It didn't detect anything, so I'm going to ignore the fact that it triggered anything to begin with. Uh, go to meeting because I share with other people what happened. And then I'm going to go ahead and say app data is very important to me for sure. I'm going to select all these. Um, Bob was up to nefarious stuff maybe. And come down here, there's the .NET stuff, regedit, uh, could or could not have been me after the fact, anti-malware, I could care less, audio, I could care less, command line, I for sure want to keep, uh, DLL, make cab, oh, maybe something was uh, compacted and sent out, MSIE exec, we'll keep that, notepad, um, clearly, I don't recognize opening those files, so let's say we'll keep those, and uh, we're running through these, boom, 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 and uh, what else is in here, shirts filter, shirt protocol host, uh, snipping tool was me taking screenshots, sysprep, huh, I don't remember running sysprep, that's interesting, we'll look at that in a second, uh, VSS, we'll look at that, and uh, let's see what else is in here, were manager, huh, hmm, looks like something crashed, uh, that may never be good, uh, those don't tell me anything, so I'm going to ignore those, this doesn't tell me anything, I'm going to ignore those, uh, process ID, those GUIDs might be important later, but not right now, uh, that looks interesting, oh, CHCP, so there was a language check. That's odd. It's my lab box. Who would do that? Consent? Huh. Something asked for consent. May or may not be me launching an admin mode. C script. I don't remember launching any C script. Curl, definitely me. But of course, if you're not sure, keep it. Um, go down a little further. Keep the NAs. Uh, NetSH advanced firewall. Huh. That's interesting. Ping. I don't recognize those pings. Let's keep those. Uh, task hosts may be important later, but right now, again, uh, we're good. So I'm going to say, let's keep just that. All right, so what do we find? Well, this is interesting. Um, there's a batch file, display bat. Um, and again, here's the parent command line. I'm going to shrink this a little bit or widen this a little bit, but let's move it out of the way for a moment. Um, let's move the hash out of the way for a moment. Uh, what I want to see is the, the commands. So the attrib command ran right here against these files here. Team viewer? What normal process would possibly change the permissions and a trib TeamViewer in a directory where TeamViewer is not installed? Malware. So now we're on to something. So here's some batch files. Here's some renamed TeamViewer files. Um, again, so we know now that this is potentially uh, suspicious. So we'll go ahead and say, ah, that, that looks really interesting to me. And I now have something to focus on. Um, okay, Office BSS Sync, I can probably get rid of that. Um, this is interesting because this is the event that I actually executed. Um, so more than likely, this is probably out of a sequence. So let's go to sort. This is looking at a sequence to me. If I do that, I'll get everything back, so we'll leave it there. Um, uh, normal dot dot was... Uh, Opened with Notepad++, Plus. that was me, so I'm not going to mark that. Uh, this is interesting. Temp, 9.exe. Uh, okay, uh, this is a lab box. I did not execute 9.exe. Uh, here's more, and we click on that. And uh, here's Reg Tlibs display drivers in that same directory. That happens to be the, the odd thing that, uh, uh, that was launched. Here's some more batch files. Here's, uh, we'll highlight those. Clearly not something I did. Here's some captured. So one of the tricks I, I do in my uh, lab analysis is I create a batch file in my known directories that I'm monitoring for, and I capture anything dropped into those directories to catch the thing that Betcher talked about where malware will run, write something, and then delete itself. So what I'm trying to do is actually capture that for further analysis. So I managed to, in the course of this malware executing, capture the batch files and, and VB script that occurred when the uh, malware executed. Uh, RegEdit was launched, could have been by me. Uh, don't know at this point until we look further. Um, here's some interesting directories. Bob, app data local, some funky name, some funky executable. Yeah, and if you look, the command line actually executes 9.exe with some parameter of 3. Yeah, that can't be good. Here's some auto, here's some automations or changes to the Windows firewall. Now, the, yep. This turned out to be a malicious Word document that contained 
some uh, VB script, some macros, right, built into its macro word stuff. It wrote these batch files and VB files to disk, which then executed modifying the Windows firewall. Uh, you can actually see through the data of the firewall what policy got changed. In this case, Open Explorer to the Internet is what it did. And um, it dropped malware. It, it made the communication out to the CNC. And it then went ahead and pulled down the team viewer to the environment to give them a backdoor to the box. It also here checked the uh, the language of the system, so they wanted to know what language the system was on to give them an idea where they were. Here's the funky VB script that was executed on the box as well. So uh, here's me curling it. That's not bad. That's just that's just me doing stuff. Um, the other unique, actually, no, this is actually bad. This is a different environment. Um, they actually went out to Dropbox and pulled the payload down from Dropbox. So here's an indication where cloud storage is being used in the course of this malware. And, and there's the list of the malicious activities and how quickly I was able to ascertain them through LogMD. Um, I know the locations of the malware now. I know, at least I can cut the head off the snake. Um, I did not have uh, any entries for file and registry auditing, again, to point out um, the persistence mechanisms of where maybe wrote to the run key or any services installed. Um, that's really something you should do in a lab box is turn on this file and register auditing so you can capture this as a part of it. And um, now I can also see the communication that happened to the box. So now if we scroll over and look at the executables that are going on, let's actually uh, uh, sort this. Uh, by doo -doo 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 -doo. image name. Oh, where are you? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Too far up. Uh, come on, new process, new process. Where are you? Nope, nope, nope. Pit after that. There we go. So we'll do this only because uh, it makes it easy to to filter stuff out. I don't want Chrome. Um, and this is the main piece that I'm going after very quickly. I remember I said how long this takes me after an hour. I don't. I know I went to Chrome afterwards, so I don't want this. I definitely want WinWord. I know I launched that. Uh, I definitely want to see where Curl went. I definitely want to see where the malware went. And we'll just pick a couple of these so it's real obvious. And I want to see where TeamViewer went and where 9.exe went. Let's see if we caught anything. We sure did. So now I have the IP addresses that I know for a fact involved in this particular Malo payload that I can say, all right, if anybody else visited these IPs, they are infected. Now, how, how long did it take me? Not very long, 15 minutes, only because I had to explain it, right? So uh, that's how powerful this tool is in a lab and or suspect system. This is uh, the concept of comparing, you know, using the good to find the bad, um, using what we know, the behavior that triggers with malware, even if it's APT. Uh, this methodology came about from fighting the Chinese um, and so we're applying that logic of the behavior to what we want to look for in the in the logs. Yeah, I could have cleared the logs and this is worthless to you. Not really. I would have seen you cleared the logs and now I would immediately not pass go and have that box reimaged. Or I would just do manual, old-fashioned, you know, good system compared to, to bad system malware discovery on it and I would do it the old-fashioned way. That is a huge indicator. Oh, I logged PowerShell command line, but I just executed uh, execution bypass. Okay, but that tells me that's what you did, so now I know to go look at use this other mechanism. So even if you clear this stuff out, it would lead me to go to an approach that speeds things up. So it's quite quite valuable. So that fast, I can give you the tidbits of what happened with this malware. So I now can tweak my security tools to look for these artifacts very quickly, faster than anything else I've ever used, other than my homemade scripts. Yeah, I mean, I hope it takes off, and uh, we're constantly adding new things, new features uh, to make it even more better, more robust. Can you get a new? Uh, can you get a new handle, Viger? Can we? Can we? Can you give you a label, you Leroy instead of Leroy? Call you Viger. Viger, what's that? Viger, Star Trek <laughs> One. Ah, yeah. that's classic. hey. I've seen all of the TOS. What? 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 <laughs> 
Star Trek well, motion picture is what we were talking about. A long about. time ago, but I'll rewatch it pretty soon. Yeah, you can reach me at uh, Betcher Pwn, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. I'm at Hacker Hurricane, is my blog and my Twitter handle. And you can find me at MauerArchaeology.com. And you can find both Betcher and I at LogMD.com. Log, well, oh, almost screwed that one up. Log MD.com. We are not the tree yeah, doctor. If you type I think in. That will uh, become apparent. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> M-O-U-S-E. Bye bye. All right, and they can't post that till DerbyCon. No. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta wait till DerbyCon to uh, post this break. Take the thunder out of the DerbyCon stuff. You can't post this till DerbyCon. You gotta post it while you're at DerbyCon. You can prepare it and remote in and upload it. What hotel are you staying in? Post it as late as possible. Keep it close to DerbyCon. We don't want to have a get overwhelmed with questions. I'm not here next week. I'm at I'm at Splunkconf. Monday through Wednesday, then I'm on a plane Thursday. So I, I kind of don't want to be uh, slammed with a bunch of questions and emails because we have not posted online yet. And, and I will not be doing so until that Sunday at DerbyCon or actually Saturday or actually Friday <laughs> because my talk's on Saturday. So I'm going to post the tool on Saturday to give us as much time to, to tweak and do as much work as we can do between now and then. So there is no tool to be had there, and I don't want to get bombarded with a bunch of questions if at all possible. <laughs> 